Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast where we explore what's possible in the world of investing. If you're just joining us for the first time, a massive welcome to the show. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you? I'm very good, Bryce. Uh, although I do have a bit of a sore neck, I must say. Why? I've got whiplash from the last week. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> not your best, but not your worst either. It's certainly not my worst. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people in markets, especially those that were uh, engrossed in financial media over the last week, are feeling a bit of whiplash. Yeah. Because we went from uh, horror global bloodbath, that's a quote, yes. um, to pretty benign end to the week and start of the new week. Well, I think we had the uh, the S and P at least had its best one day performance since two thousand and twenty two to close out the week. Okay, the S and P uh, five hundred from the start of last Friday to time of recording down zero point zero four percent. There you go. So if you're away on holidays <laughs> and didn't check your portfolio, you'd come back and think nothing had happened. Yeah. So I think, look, that's what, that's where we want to start the show. We don't want to dwell on it for too long because like the story's been told. We've spoken about it in the past few episodes, but what happened at the uh, a couple of weeks ago now uh, wasn't some horrific stock market, um, you know, once in, a, uh, once in a decade crash or, you know, it wasn't a bloodbath. It was completely normal yeah it was a feature not a bug yes five percent uh, drops happen literally every year on average mm. so let's move on to more interesting news and what are we doing on today's episode so we're going to be looking at what is going on with sports betting here in australia because yes. there's been a lot of headlines around potential banning of sports betting ads so we're going to look at that and then the implications from an investor point of yes, view. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, in the theme of the quick crash and recovery, we're going to look at a watch list for the next crash and stocks, high quality stocks that we might like to scoop up should we see another 5 to 10% drop. And then we'll be closing out with Pimp My Portfolio. Yeah, big episode. Love it. Let's start with the news. News and markets. All right. Bryce, yes. sports betting, yes. uh, a activity close to your heart? No. <laughs> <laughs> One that may make the 2032 Brisbane Olympics, though. <laughs> okay, Australia would dominate it. Yes, pokies. Now, this is, a, this is a topic where we get to sit on our high horse in some ways as a seven-year-old media company that has never taken a dollar from yes. sports betting. Yes. Despite some big dollars dangled. Serious dollars, um, yes. So... Um, Let's just put that out there because you know, we never get any credit for it. <laughs> but I think uh, let's start with the news and then apply an investing lens uh, to what, what could happen. So, Australia. Yes. We're a nation of losers. <laughs> <laughs> we are. By per capita, we move, lose the most on gambling in the world. Yeah. Close to $1,200 per person per year. Yeah, so that's how much we lose. Yes. How much we gamble per person, about $7,500 per person <sighs> per year. All up across Australia, $198 billion. Yes, billion dollars uh, wagered each year. Now, we all know it. We know how prevalent it is in sports broadcasts and everything. I think the stat is a child who is 12 years old has never seen a professional sports game without gambling ads. Wow. It's just so normalized. So uh, the late uh, member of parliament, she's unfortunately died, uh, but Peter Murphy, she was tasked with uh, reviewing and, and this industry yeah. and uh, handed down her report and a set of recommendations in... Uh, 2023. Yes. There were 31 recommendations from the report, but the important one that's making news at the moment is she called for a complete ban on gambling advertising. She suggested four phases to do it. And in perhaps the most provocative line, she said, gambling advertising is grooming children. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, to the stats to back it up, uh, 75% of 8 to 16 year old Australians think gambling is just a normal or common part of sport. Wow. So that's that's Massive issue. That's kind of like the the context this report came down. The government's been considering it and now 
we're getting some movement. I feel like since the report was handed down, there wasn't a lot of chit chat. And now it's just bang in the headlines. It's come out that there's been meetings behind closed doors and a real push for gambling ads to be banned. Yes. I have questions on whether the government can hold firm here because I think one of the strongest lobby groups in Australia would be the gambling companies. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the government have already buckled like a house of cards. Yeah. Oh, well, they? they've watered it down. So Gone from a complete ban to... So now, uh, to, to speak to the lobbying, yeah. so and then we'll, uh, where they're at, you're right, they have a massive lobby group. It's called like the Responsible Wagering Alliance or something like <laughs> nice. that, like an yeah. Orwellian yeah. <laughs> um, use of uh, terminology there. Uh, apparently, they so Michelle Rowland, the communications minister, key decision maker in this um, context. Uh, and for context, the gambling industry is always putting money into politics, both sides of politics. In 2022, Sportsbet donated $313,000 to political parties spread across both parties. So that's as much as I thought, to be honest. Yeah, honestly, uh, if you look at all the big political donors, it's never as much as you think. Yeah, right. Because we contextualize it in America. Yeah, where right. it's like 300 in yeah, 48 yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, million. So this has all come out recently. So the gambling lobbyists met uh, Michelle Rowland 66 times in the past six months. Wow. That's a lot. Um, there was a sports bet donation to Minister Rowland's campaign, which wasn't reported, but it was under the reportable threshold. So she didn't do anything wrong there, but it's not a good look. But speaking of not a good look, how about this? The AFR reported late last year that the gambling industry lobby, Responsible Wagering Australia, took Minister Rowland's out for a lavish lunch for her birthday. How's that, possible? How's that allowed? <laughs> it's like, come on. Now, I had a look at uh, the restaurant. They took it to a society restaurant in okay. Melbourne. <laughs> okay. Um, $12.50 for bread and butter. Yeah. $18.50 <laughs> for a side of potatoes. Nice, nice. <laughs> anyway, that's got nothing to do yeah. with the story. Let's get back on track. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess the question is what happens next here because they've come out and said, we're going to ban all ads. They're getting lobbied hard. The no, they, they came out and recommended. That, recommended, yeah, 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 yeah. recommended. There's been a lot of chit chat behind closed doors. It's hit the news because it's felt like it's gaining steam and momentum. You've had John Howard come out overnight. Yeah, yeah, for a, calling for a complete for ban. Calling for a complete yeah, ban. Yeah. Opposition leader, um, Peter Dutton, has called for a complete ban. So there's like bipartisan support. Yep. However, it feels like it's crumbling pretty quickly. Yeah, so it seems like where they're going to land, and this was a policy first floated by the Sydney Morning Herald, who happened to be owned by Nine, who happened to be one of the biggest beneficiaries of gambling yeah, ads. Yeah. Uh, they suggested a watered-down version where it would be uh, bans at certain times and then really a cap like around sporting events, but then a cap of like two gambling ads per yeah, hour. Per, yeah, per yeah. hour. Yeah. Which doesn't really seem to break the connection. Between. No. It just makes those ad slots a lot more valuable. Yes, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, that's probably a, a, a good point to sort of bring in the investing lens here because the industry spends $280 million a year on advertising. Yes, just in Australia, 280 and mil. Just in yeah. Australia, yes. And so when we think about, oh, this is really going, you know, if they ban ads, it's really going to hurt the sports betting companies. But really who it's going to hurt the most is the beneficiaries of this $280 million. Yeah. So I think if you were an owner of Flutter... Oh, like the which owns Sportsbet and yeah. Paddy Power and a whole bunch of gambling apps, you probably wouldn't change your thesis if gambling ads were banned in Australia. There, there will probably be less wagered, but like structurally, your thesis wouldn't change. The biggest losers are going to be the broadcasters, yeah, who are already in a world of hurt. Broadcasters and also like AFL, NRL, all of these like they'll be pseudo implicated from that as well because the broadcasting rights that they sell through. Like Definitely. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Sell through to Channel 7, Channel 9 and would yeah. that have an impact? Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah. like the, the, the total value of the game uh, is driven Diminished, ma mainly yes. by broadcast rights. Yeah. And the I would argue the biggest, I would, I would think the biggest spender in advertising, On, yeah. which drives the value of broadcast, broadcast rights, is the is gambling, the gambling yeah. industry at the moment. Yeah. 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 You know, like Nine, um, Seven West, uh, the radio guys uh, like ARN and mm -hmm. um, uh, Southern Cross Osterio, um, they, they're the ones that you'd be looking at and thinking, what impact is this going to have? Because in theory, it's substitutable. 
Sportsbet can't advertise, Mac is advertised. <laughs> but realistically, like there's only a certain amount of advertisers with a certain amount of budget and yes. that it's like supply and demand. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So then the question becomes, what are they gonna do about it? Because you're then gonna have two lobby groups hitting the government from both sides. You're gonna have the gambling lobby group saying, don't ban it. And then you're gonna have the lobby groups from media saying, if you ban it, you're gonna need to support us. Yeah, well, there's also a third lobby group, which is the sporting codes themselves. So, Gillan McLaughlin, the former CEO of the AFL, was... Who's now the CEO of... of Tabcorp. Tabcorp. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gil, during the inquiry, uh, Peter Murphy's inquiry, uh, I was listening to a clip of him saying the gambling industry money that goes to, like, jersey sponsorships and, um, mm, you know, mm. like, sponsoring on the, the grounds. You know, the Cronulla Shark Stadium is points bet stadium. Mm, and then also mm. all the money that comes from broadcasting... All that gambling industry money goes to grassroots footy. Mm. That's his argument, which is exactly the same argument that the clubs and pubs industry runs the around pokies. Yeah. And it is just like, come on, guys. Yeah, like, know, um, So anyway, the, there's three sets of lobbyists lobbying for the status quo. And then there's the public, though. A poll suggests that 70% of Australians support a ban on gambling ads. Yeah. So... Yeah. God. And I don't think it's controversial. Get it done. Like, it's not it's not nanny state to say ban the ads. No. Like no. I have no problem with people want, having a punt. But I feel like gambling it to kids. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're a problem gambler, like if you have a problem with gambling, you cannot escape it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a problem. Yeah. 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 Um Now, look, that's probably the news I would say You'd be crazy, or not? You'd be crazy if you own some of these legacy TV, TV broadcasters. But God, they're struggling before this. I'd say you'd be crazy. Like you know, Nine <laughs> have just cancelled their yeah. share buyback, yeah. cut two hundred staff. In fact, all of the major media companies, legacy media companies, have cut staff this year. Yeah, viewers are declining. This is just going to be another struggle that they face. Obviously, the money they were getting from Meta because of that sweetheart deal with the government that's going. Um, it's not fun to be in legacy media. It's not, no. <laughs> Small media startups is the place to be. But look, uh, to keep up with this developing story, plus uh, other major news headlines, uh, sign up to our daily newsletter where we keep you informed as well as bring you answers to your common questions from experts. We'll put a link in the show notes so you can sign up to that if you're not already. All right, Ren, so let's move on. As you said at the top, uh, you're suffering from whiplash. Yes. Um, it's good to have a bit of a watch list though for moments like this where you sit back and you go, damn, I missed it. I missed the 7% fall. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but having a watch list on the side of quality companies where if you are paying attention and you do have the time and a bit of cash on the side, you can quickly make a decision and get in and buy some of these quality stocks. Yeah, I also think like when it, the market could fall further. Like yeah, there's yeah. a lot of reasons that the market would fall like you know there's probably a recession incoming uh rates might not be cut as quickly as we think like the consumer is clearly struggling um so this is not just you know we no. still could be in the we still yeah. could be in it yeah 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 and so uh this segment was inspired by an afr article yes where they uh spoke to i think six fundies and uh built a list of companies they would buy in another stock market route even that terminology, st know, another route. It's like, guys, it <laughs> fell like 5%. Let's yeah. just calm down. But um, we wanted to talk about their list yep. and then add a few of our own. Yes. Yeah. All right. So some of the major stocks that got a mention, and remember, we're looking here for quality companies. CSL was the first one. Uh, Netwealth, Promedicus, Heiko. Uh, which I hadn't heard of before. Yeah, it's uh, replacement parts for aircraft engines. Oh, right. Yeah, but I don't think Not it's... Not listed in ASX. I don't ASX. think it's Australian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there was a call out for just generally well-placed REITs, uh, real estate investment trusts, uh, generally bank stocks as well, picking up them when they have a bit of a fall. And then uh, a, a fundy called Chris Haynes came in and literally named 19 yeah. companies. Just dumped his whole portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hit us with the list. So he put in BHP, Brambles, Car Group, Cochlear, CSL again, Fisher & Paykel, Goodman Group, Hub24, James Hardy, LaVissa, Megaport, NetWealth again, Prometicus again, 
Cube, REA, Technology One, Webjet, WiseTech, and Zero. Honestly, if that was your portfolio of Australian stocks, like you'd you'd be pretty happy with that. No banks in there. Uh, no banks. And, one and minor. No, and no, yeah, very yeah. few. Yes. Um, a lot of a lot of growth names. Uh, but look, I think if if you think about that list that you've just ripped through, the takeaways, and you've you've kind of mentioned it there, but it's it's almost like a who's who of quality Australian names. Yeah. There are some missing, but not a lot. Um, and I think that's kind of the point of this list and the exercise that we're doing here, which is there's a, a universe of quality companies that are sort of always selling at a premium. And the biggest opportunity when the market falls is to pick up or add to those or like add to your holdings of those quality names at a decent price. Like obviously the opportunity is just to get into the market, but like in theory getting those super high quality companies at a good price should give you above average returns. Yeah. And so yeah. that's the list that you want to build and sort of that's the, the some of the names that we've gone through here. But the question, Bryce, is what are the names that we want to add to that list? So do you want to kick it off? The only one that came to mind that... Uh, I've got a couple of others, but we'll wait to the end. But the first one that came to mind was Macquarie for me, a company yeah. I love in my portfolio. Uh it, it dropped about 7%. It's not expensive relative to market. It's PA of 22, so pretty in line with broad ASX as well. Uh, and it's just actually come off an all-time high. It's actually up 10% year to date, so it's outperforming the ASX at the moment. Um, so yeah, one that wasn't in there and that de definitely is on my list. Similar to CSL, anytime it, uh, Macquarie goes below 200, they say it's a good opportunity to get in. So I think it's at 204 at the moment. Okay. So yeah, Macquarie one for me. Nice. What about you? So one that has certainly captured attention recently and it has actually fallen recently, but uh, Ordinate mm. is an interesting one mm. um, that I think is worth uh, keeping an eye on. I also think uh, some of the players in like quite hot spaces, so like obviously data centers is a really hot space. Goodman Group are building them, There's, they're in there. Uh, but I also think Macquarie Telecom would be another one that mm. uh, is an interesting one mm. uh, playing in a hot space. Nice. Yeah. I have two more to add. Not expensive per se, but definitely quality and meaningfully down. So this is beyond just the little dip that we've had. Okay. So Mineral Resources, a yep. company that has been spoken about time and time again yep. on the show, is actually down 43% from its most recent high. Okay. Trading at a 25 PE. And LVMH, okay, uh, down twenty six percent. We, 26% we since almost March. managed to do all Australian stocks. I know. <laughs> uh, well, I was then just looking around and think because uh, some of these are on my list of like companies to look, you know, quality yeah, companies, yeah, yeah. and again, companies that um you can pick up and you can understand why LVMH is is down. But can to, you? to well, I think just what's going on with uh with the with pressures on consumers at the moment, like their businesses aren't yeah performing as well. But the weird thing is like. High end inequality is getting higher, yeah, yeah. but yeah, all the luxury. I, th I think short term here, like I'm, I'm interested in that. Yeah, like it's pretty significantly down. Yeah, massively. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a few of these companies that we've spoken about a lot on the podcast before. You know, Cochlear we spoke about recently uh, when we were speaking about Moats. CSL we've spoken about. Brambles actually we spoke mm, about recently mm. with Moats as well. Shep Pallets, um, Wise Tech Zero we've spoken about, but. A sort of sector that we haven't spoken about is this wealth platform sector. Yes. And so Chris Haynes in his list had uh, Hub24 and yep. NetWealth. Yep. Damon Callahan also mentioned NetWealth uh, in this AFR article. And just for those that have joined the show, these are companies that run platforms that financial advisors and SMSFs and whatnot can use as their broker. Essentially, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, they it's like an all-in-one brokerage platform where you can get listed stuff unlisted stuff yeah. um unfortunately it's hard for us as unadvised yeah. customers to access Classic. that's a whole other conversation Classic. yeah but it just reminded me of how crazy net wealth's financials are yeah so i just wanted to pull them out and share them because it is it is pretty amazing yeah so net wealth is not cheap no. Se trading at a 71 price to earnings at the moment. 
Uh, revenue of two hundred and seven million, up twenty one percent year on year. Now, revenue has grown double digit percentages every year since twenty sixteen. So it's growing. Mm. Gross margin of sixty four percent, and a profit of sixty seven million, which gives it a net profit margin of thirty one percent. Now, those percentages might not mean much in isolation. So let me put them in context for you. Okay. That is a better gross and net margin than Alphabet, nice. aka Google, <laughs> who have a 57% gross margin and a 24% net margin. Nice. So net wealth is pumping out so double digit growth <laughs> and is, has better profit margins than one of the best tech companies we've seen. And its performance, so last year to date, actually, year to date, up 41%. Yeah. And, and look, it's not just net wealth, it's Hub24. I think pre- I haven't look, had a good look at Premium, but I'm sure they have similar numbers. Hub24 is up 35% year to date. What's driving this? They're just getting more AUM. So, more yeah, activity. it's like it, it, they've just got more, crazy more operating people. leverage yeah. in the sense that they've built this platform. They add more advisors who add more, more funds under management. Yeah. They've got structural inflows because of the superannuation industry. Yeah. So as people get paid and as, as more money flows, money just constantly flowing onto the platform. Yeah. But then they've also got this disruption theme, which is maybe slowing down a little bit, but net wealth hub and premium really disrupted the last generation of wealth yeah, players old, like old school. Uh, BT, yeah. AMP, Macquarie. Yeah. And they're fighting back a bit, but um, yeah. So they were like taking market share. They had this structural just inflows and then they had good operating leverage. Nice. So anyway, they're very Put them on the watch list. Businesses. Yeah. Yes, I, don't I guess think... the, I guess the question is like how big how big can you be? You're kind of constrained to Australia. But you know, like we've seen plenty of really good tech adjacent businesses do well just in Australia. Car sales, REA, they're trying to push overseas now. I mean, but, you when know, you're pumping like, out growth like this in domestically like there's no reason to need to look overseas yeah, at the moment. Yeah, like, when when super just keeps pumping yeah, double digit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're no right. Need. Yeah. Nice. Well, a couple of companies there to uh, add to your watch list, and I guess we encourage you to make your own so that when there is another horror market route, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you've got some stocks on the sidelines. But we're going to take a quick break, uh, and we'll be back with another pimp my portfolio. We'll be right back. All right. Well, it is time for this is, this is pimp my portfolio. That's right. It is that time where we bring in a community member and an expert to get the community member's portfolio pimped. And today we have Noah joining us. Noah, welcome. Howdy, guys. How are we going? Very well. Thank you for uh, submitting your portfolio. And our expert in the studio today is none other than Adam Dawes. Adam, welcome. Great to be here, guys. So, uh, Ren, as always, let's kick off. Can you explain Noah's portfolio? Yeah, so Noah has a portfolio of ETFs. Um, the biggest holding is the iShares S&P 500 uh, ETF, about 35% of the portfolio. The Vanguard Aussie shares, next biggest, about 16%. And then Vanguard Diversified High Growth uh, at about 13% of the portfolio. Uh, but we do have a number of other ETFs here. We've got uh, the beta shares, Diversified All Growth, uh, Fang Plus, Global 100, Aussie Property, India, uh, Asia X Japan, and NASDAQ 100. So a number of ETFs. We've got some crypto, a bit of Bitcoin in there, uh, and then a few mining companies, Latin Resources, Rio Tinto, and Minres. So, Dorsey, we always start with a bit of a nickname. Do yeah. you have one for this? Well, Noah's going to save us on this one for the ETF boat that's <laughs> going to be uh, floating along there. So, Noah, well done on the... Uh, on the diversification of your ETFs. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Noah, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you built this portfolio, how it came to be? Um, yeah. So, the, the first two are obviously the iShares and the Vanguard, which everyone jumps into normally when they get started investing. Um, but probably about three years ago or four years ago when I started, I feel like there was a, a new flavor of the month every <laughs> every couple of months with ETFs coming out. And I was like, oh, okay, that looks good. I'll get some of that. That looks good. I'll get some of that. And then it's kind of just four years down the track. I'm like, I've got everything. So it feels, <laughs> it feels a bit, especially I'm heavily weighted towards Australia. So there's a bit of that 
homegrown bias, which I know is a bit unsafe. But um, yeah, I think I may have been caught by that analysis paralysis and over diversification uh, in some areas. Well, look, um, I think the, the good news is you're certainly not alone. I think uh, a lot of investors become sort of ETF collectors and um, there's always a new flavor of the month because there's so many. But Dorsey, when you see uh, clients like this, how do you <coughs> counsel them? Yeah, so it's an interesting one and, and, and now well done. Like it is a well diversified portfolio, but I think potentially it's probably too diversified. Does that make sense? Yeah, you, yeah, you, 100%. Yeah, you, you've, got, you've got lots in there. Um, obviously, the IVV is the standout because if you bought that four years ago, you are well in front on that. So um, comfortable with the percentage basis that you've got there, albeit it's probably a little bit high. Potentially, you know, you mm -hmm. might want to sort of bring those percentage weightings down a little bit um, and then diversify yep. that money into something else. So that, that would be sort of not really concentration risk because I think you're pretty safe in the S&P 500. Let's be honest, it's been fantastic. It's coming a little bit unstuck now with uh, what's going on in the US and things like that, but the, the growth is is still going to be there. So you're okay with that. Some of the other ETFs are, are sort of more index-based, you know, the FANGs and uh, the FTSE. And then so you've got the Global X FANG and then you've got the beta shares NASDAQ 100. And I, you need to lift up the hood and have a look inside there, but I suspect they're pretty much going to be the same kinds of businesses in there as well. So you could look to sort of consolidate some of those ones that are that are like for like as such. So in other words, the Vanguard diversified high growth and then the beta shares diversified all growth. Mm. You'd look into that as well and potentially look at say, okay, which one is a better one? Which one has a lower MER? And then move to sort of uh, to sort of consolidate some of that, which would then free up some capital to then look at some of these other, whether it's a thematic ETF or some of the other stocks that we have. So, like like a lot of portfolios here in Australia aren't diversified, which is what tick you've done that. But also a lot of other portfolios don't have a lot of international exposure. So I think you, you know, you're doing really well on what's going on there. I just think it needs to be consolidated a little bit. And then sort of, yeah, sort of get those weightings uh, a little bit better. Generally, we like to have a 5% weighting in any one stock in a portfolio and no more than 10 to 20% in one stock or one ETF. Okay, so if that helps a little bit to sort of look at sort of the highest po the portfolio position to the lowest, that's where you could probably do some topping up and, and moving around. What is the reason yeah, okay. for no more than 10 to 20% just for those who might have in this situation, 35. Yeah, so portfolio risk. So if you've got 50% of your portfolio in one stock now, if it, let's go back to the Australian market, if or if it was Nvidia, fantastic, ha happy days. If it was Commonwealth Bank, happy days, you would have been doing very well. But what happens when that stock, Nvidia, falls by 20, 40, 50, 60, all of a sudden your portfolio is very much concentrated into one stock, 20% plus, that will then, doesn't allow for that diversification. If one falls over, that's okay because I've got another 10 that are doing all right. That's one stock that will really pull down the performance of the portfolio. So mm. it's just concentration risk pretty mm. much. Mm. So Noah, uh, how does that um, uh, general advice sound? And I guess, do you have any questions for Dorsey while you've got him? Yeah, I was about to say, so Adam, you would hate the VDHG and like all the DHHFs of the world. You're not a big fan of one in all in of a diversified yeah. ETF. No, I think they do represent a good place in a portfolio if it's if it's thought out correctly. And so the high growth one, I think the Vanguard one probably is the better of the two, but I'd let you make your own decision on that. Um, it, it does offer some growth and it does offer that. It's either you put all your money into that kind of thing and just let it sit there because it is that asset allocation kind of ETF or you could use it for some kind of of the growth component, but making sure you look under the hood of the ETF, looking at their weightings, looking at understanding what's in the portfolio, that will then allow you to then be able to then go around the outside of that to build the portfolio in a correct manner. So instead of the sort of the shotgun approach or the you know dart on the, on the, or you can on the pin the tail board. on the dog <laughs> kind of thing, you've actually got some strategy behind what you're doing. And I think that's, that's where a lot of people, like you say, um, it, you know, oh, I just found this new ETF, it looked good, so I, I bought some. So going back and then actually stripping it back and actually going and looking at the fact sheets, 
going look at the website, looking at their top 10 holdings, look at all of their holdings because you can pull all of that out. And then from there, using that as a base to then build the portfolio around that. So I don't mind them. I think that they're fine. Um, what was the reason for um, uh, Latin resources? I mean, I know it's lithium, but was it just a sort of the, it's because it's a sort of a decent size of the portfolio. Is it sort of, has it grown or I, is it, yeah. Yeah, I bought that quite like a couple of years ago, like for cents on the dollar right. and it's just kind of taken off and it's yeah. kind of right now just a bit of, do I pull the trigger and sell or can it, can it, can it make me retire? <laughs> <laughs> well, do I have to be mucking around with ETFs? <laughs> yeah, just... so obviously lithium's in a tough space at the moment. I don't think that lithium Correct. is going to, it's going to continue. Like the story behind it, the thematic behind it is actually very, very good. What I recommend to people that have had such a good run on certain things is that you take your original capital out. Let's say you bought it for $10, it's now worth $20. You take that $10 out. Now, if it goes to $100, happy days, you've still got some stock in it. If it goes to zero, you've kept your capital and you're then using that capital then to go and buy something else. Does that make sense? So yeah, yeah, 100%. De-risking the portfolio. So take what you've got out of Latin resources, take out your capital, use that to go for somewhere else. And then yes, you can retire on this thing because it is going, <laughs> going to be longer and you've got stock in it and it's at no cost to you. That's what I want to hear. It's going to the moon. Thank you. <laughs> Personal <laughs> advice. So please seek professional advice yeah. before you do yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I think it's, especially with those ETFs, like how I've just got a few at the bottom, it's pulling that trigger and actually selling and then re-diversifying and just fixing up those weightings. I think that's, and especially what a lot of your listeners have struggled with as well is pushing that sell button and realizing potential mistakes and then well, you, diving you, you do get in. emotionally attached to stocks, right? Yeah. And that's where a professional comes in who doesn't have that emotional attachment and can look at it and give you that sort of, this is what you need to do because that's the key to being quite successful in, in the share market is not to get emotionally attached. And the IVV, you know, I can guarantee you're emotionally attached to that one because it's been a cracker. <laughs> so, like, it's yes. tough to then <laughs> reduce or reweight. But looking to take out your initial capital is a really good idea because that then gives you some more capital then to put somewhere else and for that to grow as, as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I think, um, I think that's probably a good spot to finish. Um, no, I hope you got uh, a few ideas to, to go away and think about. Um, but I think, yeah, everyone listening at home, as Ren said at the top, this is certainly how a lot of us started our mm -hmm. investing journey, a bit of flavor of the month. And now we're dealing with portfolios that need a bit of cleaning up. But, um, yes, thank you so much, Noah, for, uh, for submitting to Pimp My Portfolio. We really appreciate it. No, perfect. Thanks. Thanks for the insight, guys. If you'd like to submit to Pimp My Portfolio, head to equitymates.com slash contact and all the information will be there similarly if you would like to chat to adam Dawes or any of our advisors head to equitymates.com advice and there's a form that you can fill in there and we will put you in contact with adam and the team but adam thank you so much it's been a pleasure yeah thanks so much Equity Mates. i will say this about investing everything you do learn is cumulative what i learned at 20 is useful.